Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, I am going to give all of you Ubuntu beginners out there an entire video dedicated to getting you started with running Ubuntu on your laptop or desktop. I'm going to talk to you about some considerations, things to think about before you install it, and then I'll walk you through the installation process both with a full install walkthrough as well as a walkthrough on dual booting with Windows 10, and then I'm going to show you how to use Ubuntu how to install software, it's going to be great. But before we get into that, I want to take a moment to mention my sponsor, Linode. Linode has been doing cloud computing since 2003, which is actually before Amazon Web Services was even a thing. On Linode's platform, you can get your server up and running in minutes, and they include all of the popular distributions, such as CentOS, Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, and get this, also Arch Linux. And let's be honest, what could be better than a Linux cloud server provider that allows you to tell all of your friends, I run Arch? Linode has multiple server plans available to make any app scalable and flexible. You can use it to host a blog, set up a VPN server, a Minecraft server, or you could do what I did and set up a website for your YouTube channel because the official website for Learn Linux TV runs on Linode. And Linode offers 24 by 7, 365 support, regardless of plan size, so you can get live help from a real person when you need it. New users can get started right now with $100 in credit towards a new account. And I highly recommend you check them out because Linode is awesome. And I want to extend a special thank you to Linode for their continued sponsorship of Learn Linux TV. I really appreciate it. Also, I want to let you guys know that I have a new book available. It's called Mastering Ubuntu Server 3rd Edition, and it's available right now. The 3rd Edition includes some new content, such as a chapter on Kubernetes, a chapter on AWS, and more. And it turned out really well, if I do say so myself. So please check it out at ubuntuserverbook.com. And if you've already read it, please leave a review somewhere that would really help me out. So with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so what I'm going to do is show you how to install Ubuntu, but before we can do that, we need to actually create bootable media that we can use for the installation process. And here I am actually on a Windows desktop because I know a lot of you out there are actually coming from Windows. So I wanted to show you guys the process of creating bootable media for use for installing Ubuntu from a Windows machine, but it really doesn't matter which operating system you are currently running. You could also be running Mac OS for all I care because the tool that I'm going to use is the same regardless of your current operating system. So to get started, what we should do is open up a web browser. I have Firefox installed right here. And we want to go to ubuntu.com. And here on the website, we can click on the download button. And then here where it shows Ubuntu desktop, we can choose LTS or the non-LTS release. Now, if you need a long-term support release, you would go with this one. But if you want something more bleeding edge, then you would go with the newer version. The version number basically works out as year and then month. So here we can see 2020, April, and then this one is 2020 and then 10, but we simply refer to it as 2004 or 2010. And depending on when you are watching this video, there could be other versions shown here, but the basic thing to understand is that the LTS version stands for long-term support. It's supported for up to five years with security updates. And then the non-LTS release is supported for just nine months, which means that you will need to upgrade within nine months to stay current. Otherwise, you will stop getting security updates. So again, I'm going to leave that up to you. For most people, I like to go with the LTS release. But if you have just purchased a brand new computer, 
you probably want to go with 2010 because the newer version is going to have newer drivers. But again, I'll leave that up to you. In my case, I will actually download the latest version and the download automatically started. Now the file format is an ISO file, which historically has been used to create DVDs and CDs. Basically the ISO format is a clone of a CD or a DVD in file form. And even though we really don't burn DVDs or CDs so much anymore, the file format has remained the same. We'll actually use a flash drive for the installation, so don't worry that this is a format that is specifically catering to CDs and DVDs. We could still use it. The format is now pretty much universal, but the name has remained the same. I'll click OK to actually start the download. You can see that it is downloading here, so it's going to take a few minutes. And then what we also should download is a utility that we can use to actually turn that ISO file into media that we can actually boot from. So we'll need to download something called USB Imager. So I'm just typing it here in the search. That should be all I need to do. USB Imager, all one word, no space. And we're looking for a GitLab page like we see here. So let's go to that. And I will have links in the description down below. So you could basically just click on those links and go directly to the things you need. You don't actually have to search. And the reason why I like this tool is because regardless of which operating system you are currently running, you'll be able to use the same tool to create bootable media. As you can see, we have a version for Windows, Mac OS, and even versions of Linux. So again, regardless of what you are currently running, you'll be able to use USB Imager. So I only have to describe the process once and it works for any operating system. So in my case, I'll download the Windows version. You just download whatever one matches your current operating system. So I will save the file and that file will download super quick because it's super small. As you can see, it's only 142 kilobytes. Now the Ubuntu file here is going to take a little bit more time to download because it's much larger at around 2.7 gigabytes as of the time I'm recording this video. So I'll give it a minute to download and then I'll be right back. So at this point, both of these files have finished downloading. So I shouldn't need the browser anymore. And if I go to the file manager here and then into the downloads directory, you can see that I have both of the files downloaded. So I will extract USB Imager. Let's go ahead and open that up. And we get this little warning alert. It's fine. I'll just click more info, run anyway. And uh, let's go ahead and get that running. And it is. So this is USB Imager, the utility that we will use to create bootable media. And this will erase everything on the flash drive. So if there is anything important on your flash drive, make sure that you back that up because we'll need to dedicate the flash drive for this process. So the first thing that we will do just click right here. We will select the image that we've downloaded. Here's the Ubuntu ISO image. Let's open that up. Now that's selected. I should be able to close this. You don't need that anymore. And then the next thing we'll do is select the flash drive that we want to use for this purpose. So I will insert my flash drive right here. And you can see that it immediately selected the flash drive here on this list. If you have more than one flash drive on your computer, then this will actually show more than one. Just make sure that you are selecting the correct flash drive. I only have the one, which is this one right here. We know it's not the card reader, so this is the only option. So what I will do is click the right button right here to begin the process, and it starts immediately. You can see down here a progress bar is starting to fill up. It's telling me it's going to take about a minute or so for this to finish, so I will let this finish and then I'll be right back. All right, so the process has completed. I have successfully written the ISO image to the flash drive and I can now use it to boot my computer into Ubuntu and start the process. And the method that you will utilize to do that depends on your computer. With Dell, for example, it's usually F12 to access the boot menu. It varies from one computer to another, but essentially what you do is you reboot your computer, make sure the flash drive is inserted, and then you press whatever key combination you need to press at the beginning 
of the boot process to activate the boot menu and then you select the flash drive as the boot option and then if all goes well it should actually boot right into Ubuntu. So in the next section what I'm going to do is give you guys some tips on how you can test compatibility with Ubuntu on your computer before you install it. So once you have booted from the installation media that we've created, you will see this screen right here which is giving us the option to try Ubuntu or go straight into the installation. Now I highly recommend that you try it first. And what that will do is actually allow you to test compatibility before you actually go and install Ubuntu on your computer. So I'll click try Ubuntu right here. And then after you click that button, you will actually be using the Ubuntu desktop already. We haven't even installed it yet. It's actually running off the flash drive in what's called live mode, which allows you to demo Ubuntu before you install it. To actually install Ubuntu, you will click on this icon right here to do that. But we're not gonna do that yet. Before we actually install Ubuntu, we need to make sure that it works on our computer first. Now Ubuntu has great hardware compatibility. It's among the best but it's not 100%. No operating system has 100% compatibility. Ubuntu is supported on the majority of hardware out there, but the onus is on you to verify compatibility before you install it. What I have seen a lot of people do is go straight to the installation by double clicking here to open up the installer and then they'll just navigate straight through, blow away their current operating system, and then when it's done, they will create a message in a Linux help forum or maybe a Linux Facebook group, and then ask for help. You know, Ubuntu doesn't work, I can't access the internet, or something like that. And you know, I'm very happy to help people that are in that situation, but I do feel that that's a situation that should never happen. Why? Because again, we need to test compatibility before we blow away our current operating system, and that's why I had you click the Try Ubuntu button instead of the Install button. First and foremost, we need to make sure that we have a network connection. In the upper right hand corner here, we have a menu we can drop down and then we could find out if we have an internet connection. Now this laptop has Wi-Fi and I haven't even added my Wi-Fi password yet. So if I open up a web browser and we have Firefox pre-installed right here, if I go to my website, obviously it's not going to work. So let's go ahead and get connected to Wi-Fi then. If you have a Wi-Fi card that is supported, then you should have an option here to connect to Wi-Fi. So if I click on that and then click Select Network, it's going to show me a list of Wi-Fi networks that are in my area. Now, if you don't even have a Wi-Fi option at all in that menu, or if you do and it shows no networks here, despite the fact that you are sure there's a Wi-Fi network near you, that probably means that your Wi-Fi card is not supported and you should not install Ubuntu until you find out how to fix that. Sometimes it comes down to replacing the Wi-Fi card with a known working Wi-Fi card. Other times there might be specific instructions to get that going. Most of the time you will have no problems. On most hardware, Ubuntu will find the Wi-Fi card and be able to use it no problem. But there are a few Wi-Fi cards out there that are not supported. So if you do not have an option to connect to Wi-Fi and that is something you need to be able to do, do not continue. Make sure you go to a Linux help forum, a Facebook group, or even the community forums for this very channel. Tell us what the model is of the computer that you're trying to install Ubuntu on. And maybe we can help you try to find out why you don't have that option. But I do, so I will click on my Wi-Fi network here and connect to it. I'll add the password. Click connect. And now we are connected. Right here, it actually shows that the Wi-Fi icon has some signal. If I refresh this page here, you can see that we are actually able to view this web page. Now, if you don't even have a Wi-Fi card and you're just going to plug in an Ethernet cable, then this step probably worked just fine already. You probably have an icon up here that will be in the same place as this Wi-Fi icon is, but it'll have the icon of an Ethernet jack instead. 
But if you can get to a web page, as you can see I'm able to do here, then already you know that internet is working just fine and it passes that test. Another thing that you should do is just click on a video. You can go to YouTube, for example, watch a video. That gives you an opportunity to test the audio to make sure that that works. And you know, it even gives you the opportunity to make sure that the video playback is acceptable as well. If you intend to use multiple monitors, I highly recommend that you plug one in to make sure that that's working just fine. And if you have an opportunity to test all of the hardware that you intend to use on your computer with Ubuntu and everything works fine, then you should be all set and ready to go to go ahead and get the installation going. And that's exactly what I'm going to do in the next section. I'm going to walk you through an entire installation. I will show you how to install Ubuntu as the only operating system on your computer. And then I will also show you the process of setting up a dual boot with Windows as well in a separate section. So if you want to do a full install, check out the next section in this very video. If you want to do a dual boot, then skip that section and then move on to the one after it. But at this point, I'm going to assume that you have backed up everything that is important on your computer. If you are doing a full install and wiping the current operating system, that's especially important. But even if you plan on doing a dual boot with Windows and you have content on your Windows partition that you want to keep, I still recommend that you back that up just in case something goes wrong. So go ahead and make sure that everything is backed up on your computer and then we can go ahead and get Ubuntu installed. In the previous section of the video, I've gone over a few of the things that you should test before you install Ubuntu. So at this point, I'm going to assume that you have backed up everything that's important on your computer and you have already tested the hardware to make sure that it's compatible. Assuming all of that checks out, we can go ahead and get the installation started. And in this section, I am going to walk you through the full installation of Ubuntu, which means erasing your entire hard drive and installing Ubuntu as the only operating system on your computer. If you would like to set up a dual boot with Windows, then move on to the next section directly after this one in this same video, because that's the next thing that I'm going to walk you through how to do. So anyway, I will double click here on Install Ubuntu. And then here we have the installer. So the first screen is basically allowing you to set the language for the installation process. It defaults to English, at least for me. If your language is something else, you could basically just go through the list until you find yours and select it accordingly. But I'm going to leave it as English. I'll click Continue. And then next we have an opportunity to set the keyboard layout. So just make sure that you actually choose the right thing. You can attempt to do a detection if you want it to be automatically selected. I like to manually select it to make sure that I have what I think I have. And then you can type in this box right here to test the keyboard as well as any special keys you may have to ensure that everything is working properly. So we'll continue. And then we have some options. We could do a normal or a minimal installation. I recommend you do a normal installation that gives you a full suite of software. Advanced users might like the minimal option because that does not include all of the pre-included software here. Just a few things like a web browser and some basic utilities. So I recommend that you do the normal installation. So that's what I'm going to do. Downloading updates while installing Ubuntu, that's a good idea. There still might be some additional updates after the fact, but having this box checked right here will make sure that at least some of the updates are installed as you install the distribution. I'm going to uncheck it though in my case because having this checked is just going to make the recording footage longer, so I'll leave it up to you to check that box. And I'm not going to check this box right here either because that's going to add additional time to the recording, but I do recommend that you check this box. I recommend that you check both. And what this box will do is make sure that if there's any extra software or drivers that's required for any hardware you may have, there's a better chance that you will have that software set up automatically by choosing this option. So I will leave that up to you, but I do recommend that you choose both of these. I will not, again, it's just going to make the recording a bit longer. So we'll continue. Now in my case, it's detecting that I already have an operating system on the hard drive. And in your case, it's probably going to show that you have an operating system already as well. Although instead of Pop! OS, yours will probably say Windows or something like that. 
Some of you might actually be installing a brand new hard drive, although fewer of you will be using a brand new hard drive. So what we want to do is choose the option to erase the disk and install Ubuntu, as you can see right here. There are some advanced features that we can utilize here. For example, we can actually use ZFS and LVM as well. And using LVM gives you the ability to encrypt your entire hard drive, which means you will have a password that you'll need to enter anytime you boot. Now that's a bit beyond the scope. You can enable the encryption if you want to. I'm just going to cancel this and just leave it selected, erase disk. I'll click install now. And then I'll click continue. And it's actually installing in the background, but we have a few more screens to answer here. So on this map screen, you are basically going to click wherever on this map you happen to be. That'll set your locale as well as your time zone. And I'm closer to Detroit, so I just basically clicked right here and set it to Detroit. As you can see, just go ahead and set it to wherever your location happens to be and click continue. Then we could put in our user information right here. So I'll just put in my name. For the computer name, I'll just call it ThinkPad. I think that's good enough. I'll leave the username as my first name in lowercase. That's the username that you'll use to log in with. Although in Ubuntu, you don't actually have to type the username to log in. And then I'll just go ahead and type in the password here. And we have an option to log in automatically. I don't recommend that you choose that unless maybe this is for an internet kiosk or some kind of computer that you want everyone to access very, very easily. It's common to need a password to log in anyway. If you are trying to join an Active Directory domain and utilize that for authentication, you could check this box. That's beyond the scope of this video, but enterprise users out there would likely want to check that box. So we'll continue. And it's wrapping up the rest of the installation. We have this little slideshow here that we can click through to see some details and some tidbits of knowledge about Ubuntu. I'll leave it up to you to click through that if you'd like. But what I'll do is just fast forward through this installation process and then I'll be right back. All right, so the installation is complete. So let's go ahead and click on the restart button here. And then I'll remove the flash drive and then press enter. And if all goes well, it should boot into the brand new installation. And although you can't actually see this, my screen recorder isn't actually able to start recording until after I log in, but I see a login screen. So I'm just clicking my name and then I'll type my password. And then now that I've logged in, this is the first screen that I see right here. It's giving me an option to connect to online accounts. If I have an account and any of these services, I can go ahead and click on it, put in my user information, and then I can benefit from things like calendar syncing, contact syncing, and things like that. I'll skip it for now. And then here it's asking us to help improve Ubuntu by sending them information about our computer and the installation. And you can click right here to see what the actual information is that it wants to send over. And as you can see, nothing here is personally identifiable. So this is not a privacy concern. Basically, this distribution is free. So if all Canonical, the makers of Ubuntu, are asking for is to get some information about the computer to help improve Ubuntu and the compatibility it has with hardware, I think that's a very fair trade-off. Now, I'm actually not going to send that info along because I've already done so. I've installed Ubuntu on this laptop probably dozens of times by now. So they definitely have that information, but I think that's a good thing to send along as a thank you for making this distribution available to us for free. So I'll click Next. And then we have the option to enable location services. And you can leave this off by default if you'd like. If you do plan on using something like a map application or something like that, you might consider turning that on, but I'll leave that up to you. Now this screen is telling us that we are all set and ready to go. We see some icons here that represent some of the more popular applications that we can choose to install on Ubuntu if we would like to do so. This is not an extensive list here, just some of the highlights. If you'd like to install one of these apps, you can simply click on the icon for that app. And as you can see, that opened up Spotify. I can click on install. I can put in my password, the same password I used to log in with. 
and it's installing the app as you can see. And now as you can see, Spotify is installed. Now I will go over how to install applications in more detail in a section that comes later on in this very video. And you could basically open the software app from this button right here. But again, we'll be going over that soon. So don't worry about that for now. But in terms of this section, we did successfully install Ubuntu. So we're all set and ready to go. All right, so in this section of the video, what I'm going to do is walk you through dual booting Ubuntu with Windows 10. Now, if you want to do a full install, the previous section of this video will walk you through that if you want Ubuntu to be the only operating system. But in this section, we are going to actually set up a dual boot. So I'm going to assume at this point that you already have Windows installed on your computer. In my case, if I go to the disk management, and I can go there by right clicking on the start button here, then I go to disk management, just to give you an idea of how the disk is set up here. You can basically see that the entire hard drive is dedicated to Windows. And we can see that right here, I have a one terabyte SSD on this computer. Now, if your Windows installation is not using the entire hard drive, then that's okay. That makes it even easier. But anyway, most of you guys that want to do a dual boot will have a Windows installation that takes up the entire hard drive, similar to how I am setting up this tutorial right here. In a previous section of the video, I showed you how to create bootable media. So I'm going to assume that you have already done that. And with the flash drive inserted into your computer, you can go ahead and restart it. Then at the beginning, you just press whatever key combination you need to press in order to access the boot menu. And then we could select the flash drive as the boot medium that we will use to boot our computer. Now here we have an option to try Ubuntu or install Ubuntu. And what I'm going to do is actually click the try Ubuntu button because we don't want to install Ubuntu just yet. We want to make sure that Ubuntu is compatible with our hardware before we install it. So I'll click the try Ubuntu button. And then, as you can see here, we already have the Ubuntu desktop on our screen. Now, Ubuntu will run a bit slower in live mode than it will run when you install it on the actual hardware. But it's very important that you try it before you install it, so that way you don't install it just to find out that it's not compatible. So now that we know that this computer is compatible, as far as we can tell with Ubuntu, we can go ahead and install it. So right here on the desktop, we have an install icon. If I double click on that, up comes the installer. So the very first screen is just asking us to select the language that we will use for the installation process. And you can scroll through the language list here if your actual language is not English. English is the default here in my case, so I will click continue. And then if you are using a keyboard type that is not the one that's selected, you can go through and choose the keyboard type that you have, and then the variation of the keyboard that you have, and then you can click into this box right here to basically just test to make sure that everything is working fine. And then we can continue. And now we have an option for normal installation or minimal installation. Now I recommend that everyone go with normal installation. That gives you a full suite of software here. You get an office suite, a web browser, utilities, games, media players, things like that. And alternatively, you can choose to install the minimal version of Ubuntu, which only includes the web browser and basic utilities. None of the other things, such as games, will be installed in that case. Unless you really do want to have a trimmed down install and then select the applications that you want accordingly, I recommend that you actually choose the normal installation option. In this box right here, to have it download updates while installing, I recommend you keep that checked. It's not actually going to install all updates, but it will install a great deal of them. So it's just less to do after the install. So there's no reason not to check this box. Although on my end, I'm going to uncheck it because having that checked is just going to add unnecessary time to the recording. But I do recommend that you check that on your side. 
And I also recommend that you check this box here where it says install third-party software for graphics and Wi-Fi hardware and additional media formats. Basically what that is is just giving you the ability to have some pre-installed drivers to support some common pieces of hardware. There's no reason not to select this because it's just going to make your experience that much smoother. So I actually recommend that you check both of these boxes even though I'm not because again, you know, I'm recording a video and the more I choose here, the longer this recording is going to take. So I'll click continue. Now here is where the installation instructions actually diverge. In the previous section of this video, I walked you through a full installation where you will actually wipe out the entire hard drive. In this case, we want to actually create a dual boot between Windows and Ubuntu, so we don't want to wipe the entire drive. So with the previous section, I had you choose this option. Don't choose this option right here. This will erase Windows and everything on your drive. We are going to leave the selection here where the verbiage shows that we can install Ubuntu alongside Windows. That's what we want to do. So we're going to leave that option there and click continue. Now, before we go any further, I'm hoping that you have already backed up your computer. Even though this process has never failed me, it's worked just fine. We're dealing with computers, which means we are dealing with chaos theory, basically. And you know, something can go wrong. And if we make a mistake or something like that, we don't want to have data that we just can't get back. So what I recommend, just make sure you have everything backed up. Now on this screen here, we are basically choosing how much space to allocate to Windows and how much space to allocate to Ubuntu. And what you can do is just move the mouse here to the center. The cursor kind of turns into a double arrow icon. And if you hold the left mouse button, you could drag it to the left and you could drag it to the right. Dragging it to the left gives more space to Ubuntu. Dragging it to the right gives more space to Windows. So depending on how much you use one over the other will determine how much space you should give one or the other. I'm going to leave it there somewhere in the middle. It's good enough for me. You definitely want to make sure you don't give too little space to one or the other. You basically want to have some room to, you know, grow and install applications and store files and things like that. So again, I'll put it here in the middle and then I'll click install now. And then I will click continue to finalize the changes. And then continue again. And now Ubuntu is actually installing in the background. But we still have a few more screens to go before we are done with the configuration. So here, basically what we'll want to do is click on the map wherever we are located geographically. So I'm closer to Detroit, so I'm going to put the little dot right here by clicking on it. And what that does is it sets your locale and your time zone. So just make sure that you put this dot as close as you can get it to where you actually are. And then we'll continue. And then here we fill out information for our user account. So I'll go ahead and put in my information here. And then for the computer name, I will just call it ThinkPad. I think that's a simpler name to use. That's the name that the computer will be known as on the network if you do any file sharing or something like that. Here we are choosing a password for the user account. I'll just go ahead and type in the password that I want it to be. And it's not the greatest password in the world, but you know, this is just an example. And I'm going to leave the selection here to require the password to log in. If I was to choose the login automatically option, it's going to do exactly what it shows. It's going to log us in automatically. And unless you are setting up an internet kiosk, you probably don't want to do that. And then if you are using Ubuntu in the enterprise and you have Active Directory, you can choose this box right here to enable that option. That's beyond the scope of this video though. So let's continue because we have everything filled out. And the installation is going to go ahead and proceed from here. And you can click the little arrow here to scroll through this slideshow, which gives you some additional information about Ubuntu. So feel free to click through this and read about the various features and things like that. I'll leave that up to you. But anyway, I'm going to let this finish. I'm just going to fast forward through the rest of this installation, and then I'll be back as soon as it's finished. All right, so the installation is complete. Now what I'm going to do is restart the computer, 
And what you won't see is the boot menu because my screen recorder can't actually record that. But what you should see on your end, if everything has gone well, is you should see an actual selection for which operating system you would like to boot when you start the computer. But my screen recorder is not actually going to capture that part. But what I want to do first is just boot into Windows and make sure that that still works. So what I'll do is click Restart Now. And if I press nothing, it should boot directly into Windows. Now I will remove the flash drive and press Enter. All right, so at the beginning of the process, when my computer first started, I chose the Windows option in the selection menu. And well, here's Windows. So I'll go ahead and log in. And there you go. I'm able to boot into Windows, so at least I know that the Windows installation still works fine. That's a good sign. Now if I bring up the disk info here, just to show you, previously this showed that I had a one terabyte disk. Now it shows that it's 469 gigabytes. So we can clearly see that it was resized. That's also a good sign. So Windows is working. Let's reboot again, and this time I'm going to let it boot into Ubuntu. And now I have successfully booted into Ubuntu, so the dual boot was a complete success. Just like with any other Ubuntu installation, it's going to ask us a few questions. The first screen is giving us the ability to sign in to any online accounts that we may have. For example, if you have a Google account, you can actually sign into that right here. I'm not going to do that though. I'm going to skip that. I don't actually have any accounts that I would like to use on this installation. But if you do have at least a Google account, you'll benefit from calendar syncing and things like that. It's probably a good idea to sign in if that's something you want to utilize. But I'll skip that for now. And this screen right here is basically asking us if we would like to provide some information to Canonical, the developers of Ubuntu, that they can use to actually improve Ubuntu. And the way I see it, more than likely you probably downloaded Ubuntu for free. And since they made this available to us for free, I don't think it's too much to ask to send some information along. And if you're at all curious, you can click this button here to show the report. This will show you all of the information that they intend to send to Canonical if you agree to have that done. As you can see here, nothing is personally identifiable. So if you don't mind, I highly recommend that you send that over to Canonical because they can definitely utilize the information and they can use that to help improve Ubuntu. I'm not going to do that on my end because I've installed Linux on this machine more times than I can count and I've already sent this information to them. So I'll just say no for now. I'll click next. And location services is disabled by default. If you'd like, you can go ahead and enable that. And I would do that if you actually plan on using a map application or something like that. But if you don't plan on using that, then you can actually leave this as disabled. So I'll click next. And then here we have a list of popular applications that we can install if we want any of these on our system. And we also have GNOME software. The button for that is right here. And also here on the left hand side. And we can use that to get a full category of applications that we can install. These are just some of the more popular ones. For example, if I click on Spotify, And then with this window here, I can simply click install to install Spotify. And then I'll type in the password that I use to log in. That should be all there is to it. As you can see, it's installing. And as you can see, it was that simple. Now in a future section in this video, I'm going to walk through the process of managing software. So don't worry about that so much right now. We'll get back to that. But for now, not only have we installed Ubuntu, but we have set up a dual boot, which is pretty awesome. So that's great. Now we can boot into Windows when we need to, or Ubuntu, and we get a choice at the beginning of the boot process where we can choose one operating system or the other. So now that we have our Ubuntu installation all set up, there's actually a few things that we should do before we start using it. Now the first thing that we should do is make sure that we install any drivers that might be required for hardware that we have on our system. 
Now this is something that doesn't really apply to most of you, but I do recommend that you at least check this to make sure that you are utilizing whatever software you might need. And it's very easy to check. So if you go down here to the Applications menu, the very first thing here is Additional Drivers. So let's click on that. And it's going to take a moment to basically search, and it has already found something. Check this out. So here we have an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1050 Ti mobile graphics processor here in this laptop, which is actually a very decent GPU that allows us to play games. But we're not going to be able to play games on this GPU without having the appropriate driver. Even if you are not playing games, I still recommend that you install the NVIDIA driver if you do have such a card as you can see here. Now yours might not show anything here. You may not even have any hardware on your computer that would require a proprietary driver. But basically I'm having you check here just in case you might. And since I do, I'm going to choose the most recent version of the NVIDIA driver. That's what I recommend you do as well if you do have such a card. And click Apply Changes. And then I'll type in my password. Now for comparison, if you have an AMD video card, for example, then it should already work out of the box. You shouldn't actually need to install anything. NVIDIA is the one that needs proprietary drivers. Now you might actually see other things here, maybe something related to your Wi-Fi card or some other piece of hardware. But I'll leave it up to you to check this section and find out if there's anything available here. The common rule of thumb is if nothing shows here as being available, then you're good. If something does show up here, you might want to go ahead and install it to make full use of your hardware. So this will actually take a moment. As you can see here, it's filling up. It's almost there. Even though it says that we do have a proprietary driver in use, we really don't. We should reboot our computer to make sure that we are using the updated software. But before we do that, we actually should install all of the updates that have been made available since the release of the version of Ubuntu that we're on to make sure that everything is up to date. And since we have to reboot anyway to do that, then I'm not going to reboot for the NVIDIA driver installation. Let's check the updates. So back here in the application menu, scroll down, and we have software updater right here. So we'll click on that. And it has indeed found some updates. It's important to keep up to date on the updates because there's a reason why these updates are made available. There could be new features, but more importantly, there could also be security updates as well. So we should definitely get them installed. If you're curious what exactly is being updated, we can expand this. Then we can see that there's all kinds of different things here. And inside the Ubuntu base, we see that there's actually a bunch more. So. They do their best to consolidate the list a little bit here, but there's a lot more going on here. We basically just need to install all the updates, so I'll do that now. And we can see that it's progressing, so I'll let this finish and then I'll be right back. So, as you can see right here, it's recommending that we restart our computer to take advantage of all of the updates, which I highly recommend that you do. And I'm going to do the same thing. In the next section of the video though, I am going to show you around the desktop environment here, the user interface, how to interact with Ubuntu, where things are located, how to change settings and things like that. So off camera, I'm going to go ahead and click this restart button here and then I recommend you do the same and then I'll see you in the next section. So in this section of the video, what I'm going to do is show you guys around the Ubuntu desktop. I'm going to show you where things are located, how to launch applications, switch between applications, as well as how to utilize workspaces, which will allow you to work more efficiently with your computer. So let's get started. Now first and foremost, there's a lot going on with the default desktop here. We have some icons on the desktop. We have some icons here on the left hand side on this panel and we even have some icons in the upper right hand corner. So in no particular order, let's go through everything that we see on the screen right now. In the upper right hand corner, if we click here, and we can click anywhere here, doesn't matter, same thing, we basically get some options that are related to our system in general. 
Now these indicators here, we have one for Wi-Fi. This will show your Wi-Fi signal strength. I have actually some really good Wi-Fi strength right now. In fact, the access point is literally right above my head. We have a volume icon here and a battery icon. And then here we can actually adjust the sliders for anything here. You can't see it, but this is going to increase or decrease the brightness. We have a selection here for changing the Wi-Fi network or just basically connecting to a Wi-Fi network. You get a list right here. And then in regards to Bluetooth, we could turn it off to save battery. Or if we want to actually connect to a Bluetooth device, we can click Bluetooth settings right here. And if we have a Bluetooth device that's in pairing mode, we should see it here and then we can connect to it. You simply just click on it and then follow the prompts. So for example, if you wanted to set up a headset and the headset supported Bluetooth, then this is where you would do that. Now here for the battery icon, we get a selection that only includes one option, power settings. If we click on that, we not only see the battery life of any devices that we have attached. I have about half remaining on my wireless mouse. Not really sure what that is, but we're going to ignore that. Battery is fully charged. And if we scroll down, we can adjust the keyboard brightness. If we have a backlight, I do, but you can't see it. But, you know, honest, it is actually lighting up right now. We can enable or disable the feature that dims the screen when it's inactive. I don't really like that, so I will leave that deactivated here. Blank screen while I'm recording. I don't really want that to happen. And then we can enable automatic suspend or disable it. It's enabled by default for battery power. So if I unplug the power and then I just let this thing idle for 20 minutes, it's going to suspend. And we get some other controls here, but you know, standard stuff. And then we have access right here to the settings app, which allows us to customize the Ubuntu desktop. And you just saw that open up to the battery section which was the last one I was on, which is how that works. We can lock the screen. So if we need to leave our chair and go get some coffee and we don't want anyone to see what we're up to, we can lock the screen. And then if I expand this here, we can suspend, restart, power off, or log out. So these are basically all of your system controls in the upper right. In the center on the top panel, it already shows us the current date. You get a little calendar here. And if we have any calendar events, they will show down here. And those will show if you have decided to synchronize to any of the calendar services that came up when we initially installed Ubuntu. It basically asked if we wanted to add any online accounts. And if you have done that, and that online account has a calendar, for example, you should see calendar events here if you have any. Now here we have system-related notifications. I don't have any right now. But every now and then, if an app shows a notification, it'll show up right here. It'll actually briefly display up here at the top in about this area right here. It'll go away after a few seconds, but if you didn't really get a chance to read it, you can click here and you can see the notification on this list. If you would prefer not to be disturbed and not see any notifications at all, you can enable Do Not Disturb mode. So for example, if you are recording a YouTube video and you don't want any notifications to show up on the screen that might interrupt the recording or make you have to edit something out, then you would probably enable Do Not Disturb mode. And as you can tell, I actually have to utilize that quite a bit. But even if you do have Do Not Disturb mode enabled, when you click on this, you will still see any notifications here that you would have seen if notifications were not disabled, which gives you the opportunity to catch up with notifications after the fact what this does here is it just makes sure that you don't have any notifications that pop up in front of what you're doing. We have some desktop icons. So here we have a link to the home folder. This is where we actually save files. And how I got there was I just double clicked right here. Similarly, we have a trash folder as well. So if you've used any other operating system that has a file manager as well as a trash folder, which is probably all of them, then you know pretty much what these do. Your deleted files will actually be stored here. And then again, your personal data, like your MP3 files, for example, family photos, whatever you have, can all be saved in here, which gives you quick access to those files. On the left-hand side, we have this panel right here, which has a bunch of icons here. These icons are favorite applications. You can mark any application you have installed as a favorite. I didn't actually mark any of these as a favorite, Basically, these were included as favorites when we installed Ubuntu as examples. But what we can do is right-click any of these, 
and then click here to remove them from the favorites. And if I do that, it goes away. And if I click on any of these apps, they will open. So here's Firefox. Notice how a dot appears to the left of Firefox that shows that that application is actually running. If we don't see a dot next to it, the application is not running. So that's pretty simple. So I can open as many applications as I would like, as you can see. And again, we can easily tell which ones are actually running. I can minimize any of these applications just like any other operating system and it just basically lowers them back into the tray. If I click on any of these icons for a running application, it brings it back. Now, if I click on this little grid icon down here where it says show applications, that will bring me to a list of all of the applications that are installed on this machine. And there's a lot of applications here that are installed by default. For example, I already have this open, but it's a full Office Suite, LibreOffice, which is included by default here. And I can open this right here, which is their equivalent to uh, basically Excel. It's a spreadsheet application. LibreOffice is a great Office Suite. Now you will actually see some people out there that will make fun of LibreOffice and say things like, you know, it's not as good as Microsoft Office and it's not compatible, all of which is completely false. I have written five books, each professionally published, and I have used LibreOffice to accomplish that. So if I was able to get five books professionally published through LibreOffice, that just goes to show you how awesome LibreOffice actually is. And other people on the publishing team were using Microsoft Office, so we were able to trade files back and forth, no problem. So LibreOffice is awesome. Now, older versions of LibreOffice weren't as good as the newer versions, so some of those opinions actually stem from reality because it was very rough when this came out. Long story made short, the developers have made a lot of improvements, and well, it's actually totally fine. Now, also when it comes to pre-installed applications, Quite a few things here. We have some games. There's Solitaire, for example. We have Remina, or maybe it's pronounced Remina. So sorry about that. But anyway, this app is actually able to allow you to connect to remote desktops. So if you actually use your computer professionally and you interact with Windows servers or something like that, you can actually connect to them from this app, which is pretty cool. And here we have Rhythmbox. If you have an MP3 collection, for example, all you really have to do in the file manager is basically add all of your music into this folder. And this app is already configured to look inside this folder to find files, and then it should show them here. I don't actually have any MP3 files, and even if I did, if I was to play any of them, I would probably get a copyright strike, so I can't really show you that. But if you do have music files, you might want to check out Rhythmbox. And we also have a shortcut to it right here as well. And speaking of that, if there is an application that you would like to be a favorite that isn't currently a favorite, then all you really have to do is just right click on it and then make it a favorite. So if I basically want to add Solitaire as a favorite, I'll right click on that, I'll click Add to Favorites, and then it shows up here on the list. And if I scroll down here, there's more applications and I will let you explore these applications to see what's included by default. There's actually some really cool stuff here. Now one more I'd like you to see is here in Utilities. It's called System Monitor. It allows you to basically keep an eye on system resources. For example, in the center tab here, we can see the CPU usage. We can see memory usage, network history, under file systems. We can see how much hard drive space is actually being utilized. As you can see in my case, not much. And then here we get a list of all the processes that are running on our Linux system here. So if we need to kill something that's misbehaving, we can right click on it and kill the process. Hopefully you will not have to do that though. Now also what we can do here on the applications menu is we can actually rearrange these icons any way we see fit. So for some reason, if I want the LibreOffice Calc application to be maybe closer up here to the top. I could just basically drop it wherever I want it to be to rearrange these icons. And what I could do is also drop it on top of another icon and that will actually group them together. So for example, I could put all the LibreOffice icons 
all in the same little box here. And it even named it Office, which is pretty cool. I didn't even have to name it. Another example is I can drag Rhythmbox on top of Spotify. Spotify is something that I've installed as a test. It named it Sound and Video. And if you click on it, you can see the icons that are inside that group. And you can also go ahead and rename them as well. Maybe something like that. I'll leave it up to you. But basically, you have full control over the arrangement of the applications on this list. Now, when it comes to switching between applications, I mean, at first it's pretty easy, just like any other operating system. Basically, you could just have like several applications open. If it opens full screen, you could pull it away from the top. And I don't know why this happens. I think this is a bug. When you do that with LibreOffice, it makes it this impossible to use really small window. So you gotta basically position the mouse around the corner there to make it an appropriate size. LibreOffice is the only application I've seen do this. I think it's just the Ubuntu implementation has a bug. I don't know. Anyway, the point is switching between applications is very easy to do. Again, just like any other operating system. But where this actually shines is that we have virtual workspaces. So if I click up here where it shows activities, then what it's going to do is show me all the applications that are open. So for example, if I had this full screen, and I wasn't sure which applications I had open. Now I could just hold Alt and press Tab, and then the Alt Tab menu comes up and I could find out what apps are open and switch accordingly. But I could also just hit the Super key to show all of the applications that are open. I can hit it again to go back to the normal mode, and I can access that same screen by just clicking on Activities. But what we also have at our disposal is Workspaces. Over here on the right, if I just move my mouse over here to the right, I have an empty desktop that I can use, and I can switch between this desktop, the one I've been using, or I could switch here to this empty desktop, and then I could basically open yet another app. And basically, I can open apps that are separate from the others. So for example, maybe I'm at work, and I am playing some solitaire, and you know, I just love this game and maybe I should be working, but I, I just need to finish this game. And then my boss comes over and is like, uh, hey, what are you doing? Actually, hopefully I'm quick enough to where I could just do this and switch back to the busy workspace where I'm actually doing work. And then when he or she walks away, I can just switch back to my game and continue it. Of course, bad example, but you get the idea. Now what I could do is press the super key and I could switch between them with the mouse. But what I actually did was I just held down the super key and then I pressed page up to go up a workspace. And while holding down the super key, I pressed page down to go down a workspace. And what you'll also notice back here on activities, I have an empty workspace right here. Now, previously I had one empty workspace right here, but now I have two workspaces that have apps. What it did was it went ahead and created a new empty desktop right here. So if I go here and then I open up, let's just say Ubuntu software, and then go back to the overview, I have another empty workspace. So basically what will happen is that it will always make sure that you have an empty workspace. And this feature is called dynamic workspaces. So the number of workspaces that you have available is adjusted automatically. So it just makes sure that you always have an empty workspace that you can switch to to start a new task. The reason why I like this is because I can have a workspace for each project that I'm working on, which allows me to intelligently segregate my workloads, and I can have all the apps that are designated for a particular purpose on their own separate workspace, which I think is awesome. So as you can see, the Ubuntu desktop actually gives us quite a bit of flexibility for how we run our applications, how we separate them, how we switch between them, and so on. Now this graphical user interface here, this desktop environment, is called GNOME. There's actually several desktop environments available for Linux distributions, and this is just one of many. GNOME is one of the more popular desktop environments, and that's actually what you are interacting with when you use the standard version of Ubuntu, although they customize it quite a bit because they add this panel here, which GNOME doesn't actually have by default. So they just basically add a few things here to make the desktop easier to use. And the reason why I mention that is just so if you try a different Linux distribution that also offers GNOME as the main desktop environment, 
and it actually operates a bit differently, well, now you know. Ubuntu actually has some customizations pre-installed that just makes it easier, and the panel is one example of that. But go ahead and explore the Ubuntu desktop. Just play around with it, get more familiar with it, especially play around with the dynamic workspaces because that is my favorite feature for sure. In the next section, what I'm going to do is show you how to install additional software. So, in this section of the video, I am going to walk you through how to install software. As discussed in the previous section, there's actually quite a bit of software that's installed here by default. Everything from a web browser to an app that allows you to view what's on your webcam, a remote desktop app, even Solitaire of all things. There's quite a few awesome apps already included. But how do you add more applications to your Ubuntu desktop? Well, let's go ahead and explore that. And to add new software, we will click right here where it shows a shopping bag icon here. It's labeled Ubuntu Software. When I click on that, it's going to bring me to this application right here, which is the app that we will use to add additional software. Think of this like the App Store on a mobile platform or something like that. You have some applications up here that you could consider installing. But more importantly, you have categories down here of different type of applications that you can choose to install. So for example, if you click on games, and sometimes it takes a moment for this to refresh. And when it does, you should see a list of applications that you can actually install. So if we start scrolling through the list here, we see quite a few. And these are all the apps that are available in the games section. Now this is not going to be all of the applications that are available for the entire Ubuntu platform. These are just applications that are shown as options that you can install that are included in the default repositories, basically the App Store, if you will. Now, it's a bit more complicated than that. I'm not going to get really deep into the theory around how this actually works, but essentially, you'll need to know how to install software, which is what I'm about to show you. So, for example, let's say you want to install Minecraft. So, right here, we have an option to install the Minecraft installer. We get a description and some information about the application before we install it. And then here we have the install button. So I'll click on that. I'll put in my password. And that's it. That's really all there is to it. You simply click on an application that you'd like to install. And then you click the install button. And then you just wait through the process and eventually it finishes. And then you can go ahead and use the application. Now you'll notice that the install button changed to remove, so I could click on that if I'd like to remove that application. It should also show up in the menu. And I had to scroll for it, but here it is, there's Minecraft. And if I go back here to the home page, and then the installed tab, we get a list of all the software that's installed on our computer, and we see the one that we've just added right here. We also see quite a few applications that I did not install. Basically, what you are seeing here are the applications that are pre-installed as well, in addition to the ones that you install yourself. So if any of these applications are just, you know, maybe there are applications you really don't want to have installed, you could basically go ahead and remove them. Maybe I don't want to have games installed on my computer. Well, I can remove it. Pretty easy. And just like that, it's gone. We also have a tab right here for updates. So if there's any updates available for the applications, then we can click Update All to go ahead and get those updated. And that's pretty straightforward. So when it all comes down to it, this is what you will use most of the time to install software. But the problem here is that not all of the applications that you might want to install are going to be available in Ubuntu software. So for example, Let's search for Google Chrome. I'm sure this is one that a lot of you guys are probably going to install. So let's search for it. And you know what? I'm not seeing it. So Google Chrome is not available. Actually, I already knew that. Because some applications out there are not actually committed to the Ubuntu repositories, and some developers just kind of keep those applications to themselves. 
but it's still pretty easy to install though. We can just open up a web browser, Firefox is pre-installed. Then we can actually search for the application that we would like to install. And here we have the Google Chrome website. I'll just click on that. We have this download button here. If I click on it, it's automatically detecting that I am running on Ubuntu. This is the correct selection by default, so we didn't actually have to do anything. I can click Accept and Install. I will save the file. And it did download, so let's open up a file manager in the Downloads directory. We actually have the file that we have just downloaded, so if I double click on that, I'll click install, I'll type in the password for my user account, and as you can see it's actually installing. Let's see if it's installed, and it is. So I'll click on it, and it's working just fine, so I will not make it the default. Firefox is actually my preferred browser, but you know, it's up to you. And then I will uncheck this box here because I think Google knows enough about me already. So I'll click OK. And as you can see, we now have Google Chrome. So every now and then you might have to install applications outside of Ubuntu software. Google Chrome is one example of that. The licensing restrictions actually prevent Google Chrome from being made available in the normal software store. But you get the idea. Sometimes you just have to download it and install it that way as you just saw. So you just saw two ways of installing software on Ubuntu. Either way, you should now be able to go through and install any applications that you would like. First, you basically just check Ubuntu software, see if the application that you would like to install is located here. If it is, there you go. If not, just do a quick Google search and you'll probably find what you're looking for. I'll leave it up to you to explore the Ubuntu software store and then install any applications that you may want. So there you go. So hopefully this video was helpful in getting you set up on Ubuntu. Ubuntu has always been one of my favorite distributions. It runs well on laptops, desktops, as well as servers. And I think it's pretty cool. So hopefully this video has helped you out. If you like this video, please click that like button because that lets YouTube know that you want to see more content just like this. And also make sure you subscribe because I have more Ubuntu content coming and if you subscribe, you'll be the first to see an alert as soon as I have new content available. So until next time, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you again real soon.